So good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. We're in chapter 40, Perik Mem of Sefer Yeshayahu. And I prepared a lot of handouts. I sent it out to those people who are online. And also for, they're here in, in the room as well. And the reason there are so many handouts is because Perik Mem begins a second section of the book of Yeshayahu. Book of Yeshayahu literally can be this, um, divided between Aleph to Lamed Gimel, uh, to Lamed Tet, from 1 to 39, and from 40 until 66, the end of the chapter. They're very different in tone. They're very they're somewhat different in language. And as a result of that, it's also the source of a famous scholarly dispute as to whether or not this second half of the book was written by Yeshayahu Anavi, whether it was actually authored perhaps by someone else. Now, the vast majority of traditional scholars maintain that this second half, even though it sounds different, and even though the subject, according to many of the Mephoshim, are things that occurred well after Yeshayahu's death, because it may be the subject are of uh, comfort and of, uh, of geula, of salvation, are talking about items that were happening already in the time of post-exile of Babylon, or perhaps even about our current exile that we're in today. And therefore we're talking really about the eschatological concepts of Mashiach, of what's gonna happen later on. Because of all of those things, ultimately, there are those who suggest that Yeshayahu couldn't have written them because it's talking about things well past his time. This machloket uh, is expressed in a lot of different ways. And you'll find it many times in the scholarly literature where they talk about the second Yeshayahu. I've referred to it in the last couple of shirim where uh, somewhat uh, flippantly, but in a very nice way, uh, Rav Amital used to talk when he was asked, was there more than one Yeshayahu Anavi? He would say, if only there were hundreds of Yeshayahu Anavi. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is, uh, there was, but when we look at it, we look at a situation where it's like two different books almost. There's a lot of differences between them. So both in terms of content and also in terms of some of the stylistic issues. A lot of people have tried to deal with this in a lot of different ways. And so what I gave to you, in addition, um, there's, 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 so it could be Nevoa, but the level of, of specificity is part of the issue. That some question, for example, he mentions Cyrus by name. Well, Cyrus, Cyrus, the King Cyrus, the Persian King Cyrus, which was 100, 150, 180 years after he died. He also talks about um, other specific details, which seem to be beyond what would normally be in a kind of a uh, of a prophecy. And so, good. So there are two different ways to argue it. And I gave you some sources for it. Now, the first way to argue it, it actually comes from the article, which is in Hebrew. It's from Amos Chacham. Mm -hmm. Amos Chacham wrote the commentary to the Dat Mikra. Uh, we've used him very, very often. And Amos Chacham in his commentary has one explanation. But what I had was a good time as well. And that is that this explanation of Chacham, I also um, used my handy dandy AI and I had to translate it all into English. Okay. So if you look on these two sides of the page, this, I did not do anything except just make sure there's an extra space between paragraphs. AI did a beautiful job of translating it. And what Amos Chacham proposes in his explanation is that there were, that while it's true that some of the prophecies are things that are talking about 150 years in the future and present some challenges, nevertheless, what it's entirely possible was that Yeshayahu, and he brings his sources, so if you look at this one two-sided page with Amos Chacham, he brings sources for it, that Yeshayahu had also written prophecies, which were he was told to record in writing, and that they weren't released. They were prophecies that were going to be later, and that it was Yeshayahu and his disciples who actually composed the book. And so therefore, you'll have later pieces that are brought in, which were prophecies that had been somewhat secreted away over the years. They weren't something that was communicated to a nation at the time of Yeshua being alive because they would have been meaningless to them. But they were released later on, those kind of documents. The, another answer to it is also from this article, 
which is Yoel Binun, and this is the article that uh, comes from, it's a page, it's a chapter, I'm sorry, that comes from um, Koren's translation of Yoel Binun and Binyamin and Benny Lau's commentary on Sefer Yeshayahu. And there, and there, what he talks about, he talks about what the difference is. And he ultimately says that what he suggests is not that there were documents that were hidden away per se, but he does say that it's entirely possible that these were teachings that were later repeated by disciples, by students, by people from the, um, let's call it the Basementrish of Yeshayahu and Avi. And when he talks about prophecies that people have talking well in the future, there, if you look on page 216, which is the third page of that handout from Binun, he does talk about, even in modern times, we by non-prophets, there are these amazing things that are said. So he says in 1840, Rabbi Yehuda Alkali predicted that the redemption would take place only uh, would only take place after a great destruction that would occur exactly a century later. Well, 1840, a century later, was 1940, was the Second World War in the Shoah. In 1905, uh, Yosef Chaim Brenner wrote that six million Jews will be hung by a burned gate. Get, give us a cave to hide in. In 1897, Herzl said, and this is a famous piece, he said that uh, when they, and the part of the First Zionist Congress, he said he founded the State of the Jews. He said maybe five years or 50 years, if you take 1897 and you had 50 years, is 1947, that there will be a State of the Jews founded. These are not prophecies like they were in Yeshayahu's time, but we even see, and he uses this as a little bit of an idea, that some things that can be said, we can see in hindsight fulfillment. The person says, hey, I'll take 12 prophecies right now, two more than the end. Right, and so the difference is, right, and so the difference is, the difference is Yeshayahu was a prophet, and to say that Yeshayahu was able to foretell the future, well, that's part of the nature of prophecy. He's able to foretell the future. But with all of that as background, that we generally, people would reject it. The Ibn Ezra, and we're now talking, the Ibn Ezra, we're talking uh, already going back to the 12th century. Uh, the Ibn Ezra has a comment. And that's this one page that I have, Ibn Ezra, the one page like this. And it just says the Ibn Ezra in Isaiah 41. And his comment is complicated. I translated it also, but this time it wasn't, uh, uh, AI, it's already been, it was translated by Friedlander in 1873. Okay. So if you just look in the Ibn Ezra, what the Ibn Ezra says is as follows. I'm just going to move it in the English part. These first comforting promises, when he's talking about the comforting promises, he's talking about the first chapters that start from chapter 40, where we're at, with which the second part of the book of Isaiah begins, refers Rabbi Moses Hakohen believes to the restoration of the temple by Zerubbabel. And we're talking about the second Beit HaMikdash. According to my opinion, it refers to the coming redemption from our present exile. Prophecies concerning the Babylonian exile introduced only as an illustration showing how Cyrus who allowed the captive Jews to return to Jerusalem. In other words, what he explains is that according to Moshe Cohen which was also an early Rishon, um, Moshe HaKohen suggests that the prophecies from chapter 40 on are really prophecies about the current exile we are in, what we will call Mashiach, to us being called Mashiach, the post-second Beit HaMikdash time. And they mention the post-first Beit HaMikdash time, the building of the second Beit HaMikdash are mentioned as illustrations. Look, it happened there, and therefore it can happen here as well. And so that might be the idea of what's happening. About the last section of the book, there's no doubt that it refers to the period yet to come, as I shall explain. Now the Ibn Ezra takes an interesting point. He says, it must be borne in mind that the opinion of the um, that the opinion of the Orthodox, that the book of Shmuel was written by Shmuel is correct as regards to the first part, till the words and Samuel died. He said, let's remember, the Gemara tells us that, Sef that Shmuel wrote the book of Shmuel. The only problem is, in the book of Shmuel, also says he dies. And this remark is confirmed by the fact that the book of Chronicles contains the names of the descendants of, da of David in genealogical order down to Zerubbabel, and the words kings we shall see and arise and princes shall work, I'm sorry, to, to Zerubbabel. He says, so we also have in Divrei Yomim, which we say was written by Zerubbabel, the one who brought back the Jews to Israel at the time of this building of the second Beit HaMikdash was Divrei Amim. And yet, after Shmuel dies, the Sefer Shmuel continues a bit. 
And after Zerubbabel supposedly finished writing the very, I mean, it continues with his offspring several generations. So what the Ibn Ezra is trying to suggest in this is that even when we say someone composed a book, we find in classic literature that there were others involved at points. In fact, the Ibn Ezra goes even further when it talks, for example, the Ibn Ezra's opinion is the uh, Chumash itself. After Moshe dies, there's a number of psukim that remain in Sefer Tvarim, and the Ibn Ezra's opinion is it was written by Yehoshua. It doesn't diminish from the sanctity of the book, but there were others involved in it as well. But then he says one other piece, and this is where it gets, he's talking about a little bit later in the Sefer, in this book itself, the words, kings shall see and arise and princes shall worship. So this is chapter 49. This is what's known in um, in, in the church as what they, they refer to as the suffering servant. It's a prophecy of Yeshayahu that we'll get to. And they, in the church, they say it's referring to, to Yeshu, to Jesus. We will go over that when we get to that parak and show how it's not the case. And yet that suffering servant piece, according to the Ibn Ezra, is going to be a major issue. And he says that ultimately that it supports the view, though they might also be explained as kings and princes will arise when they hear the name of the prophet even after his death. Because there it talks about a later time after Yeshayahu has definitely died and people are going to bow down to, to Yeshayahu. And the reason they're going to bow down to him is going to see all the things came true. The only problem is he's going to have already died by then. So what are they bowing down to? So even as he says, you know what? It might be that they're basically bowing down to his memory. Maybe that's it. Okay. However, the reader will adopt the opinion which recommends itself most to his judgment. However, what ultimately he says, and this is the last line in the Hebrew above, and it could be that they bowed down when they heard the Neshem Hanavi, they heard the name of the prophet. The one who, know, who understands will understand. This cryptic comment of the Ibn Ezra is it really expanded upon by an article. This is an article from Uriel Simon. He's one of the great Bible scholars of today, professor in Israel. Uriel Simon has a long piece. I'm not going to go through it. And if you're interested in really tough English and scholarly documents, it's very worthwhile to read. It's wonderful, but it's not something, it's not a, you know, it's not you're sitting on your lawn chair and sipping your cup of tea. Uh, you're, 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 you're mid julep and enjoying it at the moment. It's, you have to really study it. His basic premise is as follows. The Ibn Ezra was of the opinion that there were two Yeshayahs and that the opinion is based on the fact that he had no other choice except for that piece in, in Mem Tet in chapter 49, where just to explain the pshat, he was forced into it. And yet he didn't want to say it openly because it's a very challenging concept to say that Sefer Yeshayahu was written by Yeshayahu and there's a second somebody, a second prophet who was involved, who wrote the second half. It is a minority of minority opinions among Chazal. It is a an opinion, though it's the Ibn Ezra who said it. He clouded the way he said it in such a way because it was so, he knew it would be so controversial to say such a thing. So we're headed ultimately into a section of the book, which the vast majority, and we will take it according to the more classic approach of Chazal, that this section starting from 40 and on is talking about the, the comfort God wants to comfort the exiles and then the redemption. It is, there is no narrative in, it's all poetic for these chapters. M many of these chapters are what's re read after, after Tisha B'Av. Okay, in the seven weeks of the Haftarahs that we read from Tishabov until Rosh Hashanah, the Shiva, the Nechimta, they're all from this section of Yeshayahu. They're all um, prophecies of consolation and redemption. We're going to take that approach that it's written by Yeshayahu. We're going to recognize it's different in style, but to just say that there is no one who says that there were two Yeshayahus, there is the Ibn Ezra. Okay, and we can't fight the Ibn Ezra. We can just recognize that even the Ibn Ezra was hesitant in making that kind of comment, even though when you look at references, and that's what Uriel Simon does very well in his piece of explaining the Ibn Ezra. That's the background to the chapter. Now, one other piece, and that we already mentioned a little bit in, um, 
in the Ibn Ezra and a little bit before that, we're not sure who this is really addressed to. Is this addressed to the Jews who had been exiled in the Babylonian exile? Or is this going to be addressed to the Roman exile to which we are still suffering? Is, as suggested by the Ibn Ezra, that we're taking a situation, we're taking the Babylonian exile as an example and extending it further or not. And so you find two schools of thought. You have the Mahari Kra, you have the Shadal, you have somewhat of the Ibn Ezra saying that all of this is being addressed to the Jews who were exiled to Babylon. Destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. We're talking in the sixth century BCE, that it's being addressed to them. On the other hand, you have the Radak and the Abarbanel and the Malbim who say all of this is really talking, and the Ibn Ezra, who say all of this is talking about the Geulah Shlishit, the third redemption, of the, uh, the third redemption, the one that we still anticipate. That's the last piece of, of introduction to all of this. And we're going to get started now with Posuk Aleph. Posuk Aleph starts, and you know these words because of the Haftorah, Nachamu, Nachamu Ami. Be comforted, be comforted, my people. Now, this is talking to Jews who are in exile, who are suffering. And nachamu, nachamu, I mean, obviously, when you, whenever you dump, double anything, the classic response is saying it twice is for strength. That's the Radax approach. I really, I want you to be really comforted. However, in this, the other Mephoshim, for instance, the Ibn Ezra says, okay, that what this is trying to say, that this is a response to the previous parak where we talked about Chizkiyahu having shown all of the treasures of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. And we are told that his children are going to be exiled as well. And all of the riches are going to be taken away. And so be comforted, be comforted. And on that piece, that's the Ibn Ezra. The Targum Yonatan says, no, that what we're talking, the reason why it's doubled is nachamu, nachamu ami. The people who comfort, in other words, prophets, those who are in charge, what Yeshua is doing is giving them an instruction. The menachamim, the comforters, I want you to comfort them. Whereas the, um, the, the Abarbanel, who takes that approach that we're talking about the third redemption, the one we're anticipating, he says, no, nachamu, nachamu ami means comfort over the first Beit HaMikdash that was destroyed and over the second Beit HaMikdash that was destroyed. I want a double comfort. And finally, the Malbin takes the approach as no, it is because there are two forms of redemption. We're either going to be redeemed because we deserve it, or we're going to be redeemed because there's no other option left to God. So it's either going to be early or it's going to be late. And so it's the two kinds of, of comfort. Yeah, Larry. In Eichel, where it says, Eichel, where it says, is that referring to the lack of medium or lack of... That, so it would seem to be that it can be it can be explained in Eichel one of two ways. Ein la menachem in Eichel could be that no one is capable of, of comforting this immediate destruction, whereas this is talking about later, or it could be that there is no one who can, that there's no person left to be able to provide that, that level of comfort. Yomar Elokech. So this is what God's instruction. Nachamu, nachamu, amin, Yomar Elokech. God instructs, provide the comfort. Posuk bet. Daviru alev Yerushalayim. Speak to the heart of Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, in this case, means the Jewish people in general. That's the, the Ibn Ezra says that. The, and the idea of Dabru alev, to speak to someone's heart, that means to have a sense of empathy, explains the Barbanel. You're talking, there's an emotion that's associated with the people have been destroyed. Or it could be the Mitsudat David says, speak in a way that people will be able to accept it and understand it. Speak in, in that caring fashion. And call out the following. This is what you should be saying. The year, the 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 years of suffering have been fulfilled. Kinirza Avona, your sins, Rashi says, have been appeased, or the Ibn Ezra says, 
their sins are finished. Ki Hashem kiflaim mikol chatotahem. Because you've taken from the from God double of all of the sin. Now, what is double of all of the sin? Well, again, the Radak says double is same thing like Nachamu Nachamu Ami, the idea that there have been two exiles, the ex the Babylonian exile and now the Roman exile that we're suffering from. He's looking at it as this is talking about the third Gula. The Targum Yonatan says, no, what it really means is that your comforting that's going to happen is going to be as if. You had suffered double. Not that you could have been punished double. We don't get punished double. That's not God. God punishes appropriately. But it felt like double. And the Malbim says, no, that there's a difference. And this is just a fun difference in terms of dictum. There are two words that we can use for double. In Hebrew, you could say kiflaim, or you could say pishnaim. Pishnaim is double and kiflaim is double. But what's the difference? Says the Malbim, Kiflaim is related to the word lekapel to fold. And he says, what it means is that there was an intensity. It's like all of the suffering was folded into a period of time. And your, your suffering was so intense, you're going to have now this comfort from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Yeah. That seems to fit in with Yoma because Artswell translates that as this. But Yomar is So again, in all of biblical Hebrew, there is perfect and imperfect. There's not future, past, and present. And so you can translate it in different ways depending on context. So that's not too big of a problem. Um, the Radak really where it plays into is um, all of all of this is future tense. Okay. But in the translation, this ha this hasn't happened yet. In the time of Yeshayahu, this hasn't happened. This won't happen until after Yeshua has already died. The, in Pasuk Gimel, Kol Kore Bamidbar, there's this voice that is calling out Bamidbar, Panu Derech Hashem. Clear the path, God. Now, if I look at the Tamei Amikra, okay, the Tamei Amikra, under the, the Kol, there's a Munach, there's this right angle under there. And over the kore, there are two dots. There's a kef katan. That's one. Those that's two words that come together. When I have those two words come together, it's like putting them in a phrase. Pol kore, bamidbar has a zakef gadol. It's it's a, a a bigger announcing of a word. And the reason why that's important is because it should be read. Kol kore, there's a voice crying out. Bamidbar, Bamidbar being an independent word. So what is that word Bamidbar? According to the Ibn Akaspi, it should be read Bamidbar Panudera Hashem. In the wilderness, clear a path for God. According to that idea, the Bamidbar, the Abarbanel says, what is Bamidbar? Why am I saying Kol Kore Bamidbar Panudera? The Bamidbar is reminding us of the first redemption. The very first redemption that the Jews experienced was from Egypt. They went through the wilderness, they went through the Midbar. And so the Abarbanel says what's happening is, call out, and it's gonna, you're gonna say, remember back to the time of the wilderness when you were going into the desert, nothing new is gonna happen. This is going to be a strengthening of that experience of the Midbar. The, the commandments will remain the same, and it's going to be clear the path now for God with that tradition that you had. Hashem, Yashru Ba'arava, you should strengthen it, in, you should straighten it in the Arava, Mesila Lelukenu, a pathway for God. In other words, open up the way for God to return. all valleys are going to be brought up, and all mountains are going to be brought down. What does it mean? Bringing up valleys and bringing down mountains? Well, if I'm talking about creating a road, that's where you, cl you clear the road. 
Okay, and if we're talking about how the how the road should be, it should be a simple road that goes on, goes goes along. But the Mahari crowd, following the approach of the Targum Yonatan, explains no, that this is talking about those who were deep down, the Jewish people, who were suffering, are going to be raised up, and those who were high up, the nations that had enslaved them, are going to be brought down. And those things that were crooked are going to be strengthened. And the heights are going to be made into valleys. Poetic at the same time. However, it, however as the Dat Sofrim says, that you're dealing both in this Pasuk. It's not just a simple parallelism where the first half it's repeated in the second half. He says there's actually two things. There is the physical and the spiritual. On a physical level, we're making the road. That's that's what's being talked about. On the physical, we're going to be having things better. But there's also on the spiritual, which is why the definition, we're going to be able to be in a position to accept the nechama and to rise from it. The niglat vod Hashem, and God, God's glory is going to be revealed. Now, what does it mean it's going to be revealed? It's going to be revealed, all of the all of humanity will see God's glory. This is what God is going to say. According to the Radak, what it means is very simple. When the Jews come back to Israel, all of the nations of the world are going to see the power of God. And it will be revealed to them by the actions of the Jews. Or is the Datso, the Datso Frima, however, disagrees, Rabinovitz disagrees, and he says, no, it's the other way around. It's to the Jews. See, during the time of, of, uh, of Galut, of, of the diaspora, it's a period of what we refer to as Hester Panim. We don't see God. It's like God is missing. Okay, we know he's there, but he doesn't seem to be protecting in the same way. Okay. On the other hand, when we have the redemption, you're going to see God once again. And so as a result, that's what it means to see. Next part of the parak. So this is like the first uh, five sukim is the introduction. Comfort. You're going to have the comfort. You're going to be redeemed. You're going to be brought back. Prepare the time. Make the announcements. All of that is happening. Then comes Pasuk Vav. Kol Omer Kra. The voice says, call this word out. And it's God says, as Rashi explains, this is what you have to announce. Ve'amar, micra. But the Navi, the people are saying, so what do you want me to say? Kol basar chatzir v'chol chasdo God wants you to say, humanity is like the... Um, like the grass of the field, and all of his chesed, we'll see who the his is, is like the tzitzah, so they're like the small blossoms in the field. Now, when I refer humanity to the grass of the field, okay, kol basar, it means that it's something that's ephemeral, it's something that can disappear, something that can wither quickly. And in fact, according to Rashi, what this pasuk means is that the doesn't talk about the Jews, it's talking about those who have enslaved the Jews. The powers, the Romans, the Babylonians, they're like, they think they're so great, they can wither. And even those things that they did right, because even those who have oppressed us have good things they've done, it's just like the blossom of the field that can wither, they can disappear in a minute. So you think you did a lot of good things, non-Jews? Sorry. Okay, you'll be punished for what you did to the Jewish people. Rashi has a second answer, and Rashi's second answer is that ultimately this is talking about people including Jews. You need to understand that humanity, that human beings are here just for a brief period of time on this earth. They're not eternity. They're they come and they grow. And even the things that they want to do for chesed, they can't always fulfill because they may not live to see it happen. Yavesh, chatzir, naval, tzitz, and continuing in the same kind of concept that the, the grass can dry up, 
the blossoms will will uh, also be ruined. Kiruach Hashem Nashvabo. When the Spirit of God just blows across it. Achen Chatzir Ha'am. And therefore, people should know that they are not the powerful ones. It's God. And it continues, Yavesh Chatzir Naval Tzitz, poetically, it's continuing with the same concept that ultimately we can disappear. Udvar Hashem Yakum Leolam. But the word of God remains forever. Even if it takes Leolam for many years, explains the Abarbanel, ultimately God will fulfill. God is the sense of eternity. God promised it'll happen, it will happen. Unlike human beings who sometimes promise things and aren't in a position to fulfill them. Al Hargavoa, next piece of the, the parak, and this talks about already Zion calling out. Al Hargavoa on the high mountains. Alilach, climb up, go up, Mivaseretzion. The one who is announcing about Zion. Now there's two possibilities. Mivaseretzion could be the one who is the announcer or the one who is announcing about. So it could be, but get up there, make the announcements. Harimi b'koach kolech, lift your voice strongly, Mivaseret Yerushalayim. Call out strongly over Yerushalayim. Now, Yerushalayim and Zion obviously are, are parallel pieces. They mean the same. But I want you, God says, I want you to be able to announce all of these things. Now, the Abarbanel says, how does Yerushalayim and how does Zion, inanimate objects, announce things to the world? And the Abarbanel says, by their rebuilding. That when the world sees Yerushalayim and Zion rebuilt, they'll hear the message. That it's not meant just poetically, it's meant actually in, in a very real sense. Harimi al tirai. Go ahead and lift your voice. Don't be afraid that says Rebbe Avigdor Mibel Gansi, don't be afraid this won't cap, happen. Imri la re Yehuda, hine elokechem. Say to all of the cities around Yehuda, God is here. In other words, we're going to tell them, God hine elokechem. This is Hashem. Hine Hashem Elokim Bechazak Yavo. Here is Hashem Elokim. Now, why does it say the Aleph Dalid Nun Yud? It's the first word, because we want to be able to identify that this is the God who's the master. This is a God of mastery. Normally, when we have the Hashem Elokim, we normally would have the Hashem first. The Yud, the Hey, the Vav, the Hey. Here we have the Aleph, Dalit, and the Nun, and the Yud coming first. It's the Adon Olam, the one who is the master of the whole universe. That's the Dat Sofrim explains this. And he wants to explain now, it says that, uh, that Mikra, what he meant about the announcements. The announcement is, Hine Hashem Elokim, the Chazak Yavo. He's coming with strength. Uzro O Moshlalo, and his arm dominates for it. There's not going to be any need, explains him in Sudat David, for any other power to support God in, in redeeming the Jewish people and punishing the non-Jews. Nothing else which, like human beings that need help. He has his reward with him and the wages are before him. Again, what does this mean? Rev. Hirsch explains, God is going to decide who gets paid, who gets the reward. God has everything there and God is going to be making those decisions. He's going to be like a shepherd over a, sh uh, over a flock to watch over it. Yekabetz, Tlaim, he's going to gather the, the small goats of a cheko Yisai. He's going to carry those goats in his bosom. Alotinahel, and ultimately the ones who are the the nursing animals, he's going to guide. Now we go from if you look at it for the first pasuk yud, it's talking about power. It's talking about chozek, right? It's abechazak yavo moshla lo. He's going to determine who gets. And then the very next pasuk changes the imagery entirely. And what does it change it to? It changes it to sheep and a shepherd. It changes into carrying the baby, the baby goat, okay, taking care of it, because God has two roles in all of this. God's role is to protect us. So on the one hand, God is going to come and he has the power 
to take care of what needs to be taken care of. He has the ability to do it and it's eternal ability. On the other hand, he's going to talk with us as if he is the one who is going to be caring for us. He's using that imagery of the shepherd, which we find throughout Tanakh. Pasuk Yud Bet. And Pasuk Yud Bet, Mi Madad. And now we're going to talk about God. And the concept of Mi Madad means, who is this God? So the first thing is going to say, Mi Madad Bisha'olomayim. Who is the one who measured in the palm of his hand the water that's going to fill all of the oceans of the world. And who is the one who fixed the heavens with his small finger? Now, when I talk about doing something with my small finger, it means it's easy. God created the heavens just with his little, with his pinky. Who's all of this? And who is the one who placed all of the earth on the earth, the dirt on the earth. Now, shalish, interestingly, the Radak says it's a large measure. Rashi says, now, what does shalish mean? Shalish is from the word shalosh. It's the amount of space from here to here. Okay. So again, it's not even, it didn't even take his full hand to create the earth. Vishakal befelis, he goes ahead and he measures with a fellas. A fellas is a kind of a scale. Um, nowadays, modern Hebrew, a is a level, actually. They, when you have a mime, is called a level. But what it talks about, if you can imagine a, a classic scale with the two um, the two cups that are measuring like this, okay, what's called in Hebrew, a mosnaim that we'll have in a minute. Well, there's two ways of measuring things on it. One way is you just look at what's heavier, okay? The other is in that middle bar that supports those two, uh, the two things. In that middle bar, there's often an indicator that would be moved back and forth. And that's the fellas. That's, this, that's that scale that's up there. And so it, it says, he's going, Vishakal Bepeles Harim. He went and he measured with this scale the mountains, Ugvaot Bemuznaim, and the, and the hills with a, a regular scale. Who prepared the, the winds? Now, again, there's a machloket here on how to read this phrase. If you look at the phrase again, and you look at the tamamikra, the trop, under the tiken, there's a mercha. It's like a backwards comma. Under the ruach, there's a tibcha. It's like a comma. And under the word Hashem, there's the upside down wishbone, the etnachta. The way the phrase works, therefore, is tikenet ruach is a phrase, is a clause. Who prepared, who measured, whatever, the, the ruach. And so according to the Minchat Shai, the way you should have to read this phrase is mi tikenet ruach Hashem. Who's the one who prepared the winds of the world? God did it. According, however, to the Malbim, we're talking about the ruach Hashem. Who prepared the Ruach Hashem? He ignores the trop. Where do we have Ruach Hashem in Tanakh? The Ruach Elohim Rachefet Al Pnei Hamayim that we talked about, the Spirit of God. Who's the one who did creation according to the Malbim talks? The Ish Atzato Yodienu. And would a person who would give God any kind of, does any person give God any kind of uh, advice? Et Mino Atz V'yavineu. Who is the one who advised from the word like yeah, yeah, like to Yoetz, okay, and would really understand who from the nations of the world would God turn to, says Rashi, for any kind of advice? He says he does turn to the Jewish people, Rashi says, because God does turn to Avram Avinu and Vayera, Mechasani, Mi Avraham Davar. Am I going to hide anything from Avram? I have to tell him about Stom and Amora, what's happening. But by the nations of the world, he never did it. Is anyone going to teach? God and what is justice? Is anyone going to teach God wisdom and understanding? Lay your question. In the ancient, either Balatulim or Rashi says, you also have to look at the Mayamai, says Zev Koshim and Shia. That's talking in the but that's not but that's not the shot there, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so here all of these pieces, all of these questions that are being asked, what the Navi is saying is understand God. 
Understand the power of God. God is telling you to be comforted. God is telling you he's going to bring justice. He's going to bring you back. You still aren't sure of it? Understand this power that we're dealing with in God. And each of these steps, how powerful HaKadosh Baruch Hu was. Who did God consult when he created the world? Okay, God, no one could consult with him. Okay, Okay, who could go ahead and teach God what is the ways of righteousness? That's the Dat Mikra. Can anyone, according to the Marie Kra, can anyone, okay, tell God, did anyone give God advice when he was giving us the Torah of what should be in it? Okay, all of these things are, he's addressing these inanimate objects, the, the things of the world. Now he turns to the nations. Hein goyim. Okay, is it hain is like the word hello? The not the nations of the world, kemar midli, is like the bitter drop from a bucket. Now, why how do you get to kemar midli is a bitter drop? Well, mar is bitter, dli is what you draw water with, right? And the way it's described very simply, the Mitsudatsion says when you draw the water, there is this little where does the bitter water come? A little bit flows over on the outside of the bucket. And it picks up all of the decay on the outside of that bucket. That that the non-Jews are like the Mar Dali, Shachat Moznaim, Nechshavu, and they're like the dust, or what's the, being the probably a better way of saying it, even the rust of the scales that it leads up, as Rashi says, Nechoshet, that the, this is the little bit of, uh, of, uh, of dust that comes off of the brass of a, of a scale, according to the, the Datsofrim, he's just saying, all he's saying is that the, the, the Goyim, now the Goyim, remember, is now we're not talking like Goyim in a negative sense per se, but we're saying the nations of the world are meaningless. Hainayim Kedaki told, even the islands, will be like dust, God will take them. It's the, Hirsch says, Kedaki told, Kedaki says like the smallest, says like the smallest atom, that God is gonna take whatever is out there, he's gonna take these nations who have oppressed us, and he's gonna, and they're no threat to him. Ulevanon in day by air, and in the Lebanon, the Lebanon is the great forest, there aren't enough trees to be able to, Keep a fire lit on the mizbeach on the altar, vechayato and de ola, and there aren't enough animals, even if there were enough trees, that the nations of the world, explains Rashi, would be able to receive atonement. Words, at this point, you have done so much; you're not going to be able to be forgiven. Your sins are so great; you're nothing. God says, he's the all power. Yeshayahu describes God as having power over all the world from creation to the current time. And the nations of the world do not have it. Kol ha-goyim ka'ayin negdo. And the Novi says it directly in Pesach Yen Zayin. All of the nations of the world are not like nothing. Now, what is it? Kol ha-goyim says of Hirsch that even if all of the nations of the world come together, they can't oppose God. <laughs> They're thought of as nothing. So who are you going to compare God to? And what kind of image are you going to create for him? The Navi goes ahead and says, listen, God, when we say God, we have a lot of different words that we use for God. So the Dathami Krab points out that here it says, who are you going to compare Kel to? Kel is like we say in English, just the word God. It's not a word that's only used for God. When, when it's referring to God, we don't pronounce it, okay? But uh, for instance, modern Hebrew, when uh, Americans hear this, American Jews hear this, it gets us a little freaked out. But when, you know, uh, we will say, my God. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't mean this as a reference, as a sacred moment. Well, when Israelis would say it, they would say, ha Elohim. Well, Whoa, you just use one of God's names. Well, no, because Elohim both can be used in a, in a secular fashion and it can be used, Elohim can be a religious fashion. The Navi chose the word Kel here because everyone has this concept of a God. And he says, listen, how are you going to compare gods to this? And he says, how are you doing? Hapesel Nasach 
parash, the, are you going to compare God to one of your idols? Something that is cast, you know, it's cast uh, from metal and by a craftsman, by a charash, and then you're going to take a smith and he's going to cut, overlay it with gold, and then he's going to add silver chains to it. Are you going to compare God to this? Malbim points out, by the way, that if you look as who's working it, normally the tzoreif is the one who casts the molten metal, and it's the charash who normally is the one who puts on the overlay. Right? A tzoreif means the purifier. So if I have a, a, a metal, a precious metal, and I melt it down, one of the things I do is I remove from it the dross, and so I have a pure metal. Rashi, the Malbim says that the reason we use the wrong kinds of craftsmen for the different actions is to say, it's a statement that net generally when they were making idols, uh, the idols probably had at the bottom, uh, they probably said PRC, People's Republic of China on the bottom. Okay. They didn't necessarily use the finest of craftsmen. They had the, the wrong guys doing the wrong, the different things on this. Hamisukan through Ma and the person. Now there's a the machlokan of what Misukan means. Radak says Misukan is the same word as like a miskan, a person who is uh, impoverished, a person, a nebuchal. Okay. Hamisukan through Ma, he wants to give some kind of gift. It's lo yirkavivchar. He's going to choose. He can't afford metal, so he's going to make his idol out of wood. Okay, charash chacham yivakesh lo lachin pesel lo yimov, and he's going to start looking around for a person who's going to build him a wooden idol that's not going to fall over. Now the Targum Yonatan says actually hamisukan is not talking about the person building it, but the misukan is with the charash. He's, if he's going to be building one out of eights, he's going to use eights misukan, a type of a tree. It's not the person who's asking; it's the type of wood he's using. And eights misukan is a mulberry wood he's going to be using. Halo tedu, halo tishmau. You should know and you should hear. Halo who God Merosh, this was tell, told from the beginning, Lachem, Halo Havinotem Mosdota Aretz. Don't you know from the foundations of the world? Now, Mosdota Aretz is, the, according to Rashi, who was the one who founded the world? God is turning to these nations and saying, How could you do such a thing? Hayoshev Al Chuga Aretz, God is one who is sitting on the, in the heavens. Chuga is a circle. Interestingly, um, in the Marikra, Marikra says, circle. He says, this is a, a thing that is called a circle. He uses the uh, a terminology for circle called anything that uh, surrounds is called a chuk. Okay, And the heavens, because they surround the earth. The Ibn Ezra, by the way, just points out at the same time that it's also obviously the heavens, he says. He talks about the fact modern Hebrew, Mechoga, by the way, is a protractor, just to give you an idea. So the same word is used there. And he talks about that we know not we know nowadays, you know, that we know that uh that the world is round. And therefore, if the world is round, and the, the Ibn Ezra obviously is talking, and this is the 12th century, but uh, this already goes back to, to Roman times. They talked about the earth being round, that the earth was round. And since the earth is round, well, if the heavens surround the earth, then they have to be like a big circle and en encircling it. We know that God is up there. And to him, we look like grasshoppers. In other words, we're a little, you know, flying on the plane. You see the little dots down there. <laughs> uh, right. God pulls over a thin curtain, the heavens. And he goes ahead and he spreads it out so that we can settle underneath. In other words, God is over us in the heavens. God is one who can take princes and suddenly, says the, the Barbanel, he can just all of a sudden turn them into nothing. There were people who thought they were, had this great power, nothing. He'll take the people who are responsible for judgment and make them also into anything. Af bal nitu, af bal nitu, as if they were not planted, af bal zora'u, zora also as if they were never um, 
uh, plant one is a tree planting, one is a, a seed planting. Afbal Shoresh Beretz Gizam, there's no root with the with the stump of the tree. Vigam Nashaf Bahem by uh by Yvashu, also at the very same time. How does he translate Nashaf in um in um uh, he sends out to them, okay, they, there's this wind that comes out to them and they will be dried out. And the, the storms will take them off like straw. In other words, when God wants to overturn the power, he'll do it as if there was never anything there. Now, Mendel Hirsch, Rav Shamsha Rafal Hirsch's son, Rav Mendel Hirsch, he writes in he did a he did the Haftoras, he did a commentary on the Haftoras. Rav Shamsha Rafal Hirsch's commentary in Chumash, and the Haftoras is Rev Mendel Hirsch. Mendel Hirsch did on this parak because this is Parsha, this is not Hamu, this is the Haftorah for Vet Hanu. And he writes on this puzzle. He says as follows, I'm just going to read it in English. All of history, Israel's as well as mankind, strikingly reflects the never-ending gift of divine providence. From the divine revelation in Egypt to the destruction of Assyria's army of the walls of Yerushalayim, there, was, there is always the hand of God. We who can look back on the eventful millennia of our history are overwhelmed by a deep sense of reverence in the light of the prophet's message. Where is the glory of Pharaoh, of all powerful Nineveh and Babylon? Where the, mag where the majesty of the mighty Persian kings? Where is the Macedonian empire? Where the dynasties of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids? Where is the mightiest power of all the Roman empire? Is it an accident of history that the founders of these world empires, from Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander to Caesar and Napoleon did not succeed in establishing a true dynasty. Do not read on the tombstones of these world leaders the words of the prophet. Do we, I'm sorry, do we not read on the tombstones of these world leaders the words of the prophet? They were not planted and sown nor rooted in the ground. His breath caused them to wither away in the storm, carried them off like chaff. In other words, what Rav Hirsch's son says, this is what we've seen throughout history. Ve'el me, and ve'el me, and so like a refrain, God says, so who are you going to compare me to? All the rest of it is nothing. You see, these idols are meaningless. You see, your, your powerful people, I, I can turn over in a second. Who are you going to do anything about me? And therefore, look to the heavens. And see who created these. God is the one who brings out by counting his hosts, the, the heavens, in the heavens, the stars and the planets. And each one he refers to by name. From his great, each one, uh, from the power that he has of the the power of the creator and his ability ish lo adar no one is ever lost no one the ish in this point the ibn kasbi says it's a parit meaning it's a thing it's not a person it's a thing god goes at god created the heavens god makes sure that the heavens appear and the stars appear when they're supposed to be nothing ever is missing that's the power of god lama tomar yaakov utadaber yisrael therefore why, Yaakov, why, Israel, would you ever say, God doesn't see my path. And God doesn't see what has happened to me. Okay. This, the Radak says that this is a statement that God is making. This is actually the Haftorah now of Lech Lecha. That God is telling, the, that Yeshayahu is telling the Jewish people, why would you ever think God has forgotten you? Why would you think that the judgment is, is passed over? Don't you know and haven't you heard? God is the God of the world. Not only does he create the world, he creates the ends of the earth. The Malbim says it's not just something where they say that God started things. No, God finished it. Everything was God's, even the corners of the earth. Lo yi af, lo yi gai will never uh, become weakened or 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 we are tired. En There is no limit to God's understanding. 
So don't think God has forgotten about you. God gives the weary, he gives them strength. And to the one who doesn't have the power, he gives him that greater amount of power. The young ones become tired and weary. And the young men are going to begin to stumble. This thing Doc says, okay, is that even though God goes ahead, he continues to give new and new power. However, Rashi says this is talking about the downfall of the enemies. Last pasuk, v'koye Hashem yachalifu cholach. The ones who have hope in God, who believe in God, God is going to change for them the power, meaning that each day it's going to be new. Ya'alu ever k'nesherim. They're going to um, sprout wings like like vultures. A nesher is not an eagle. I think, how does our scroll translate? Is it, yeah. He does translate. Yeah, a nesher is actually a vulture, okay? But it's also a powerful bird. Okay, yeah, Alu Aver Kinisharim, they're going to bring up the Aver like Nisharim, the wings, like like Velo Yigao, they will Yarutsu, Velo Yigao, they will run, they'll never be tired. Yelhu Velo Yafu, they'll walk and they'll never be exhausted. In other words, all of this is saying this this Navua says, be comforted, understand the nations of the world who you are dealing with. God will take care of you, and to the Jewish people, continue to have faith. And that's Perak Mem, the beginning of the Pirkei Nechama of Sefer Yeshayahu. Next week, we won't have Shir, unfortunately. We'll be, Mark and I will be on the way to Israel. The week after, and the week after, we'll be having Shir as regular. So we'll have next week, no, and then the next two weeks, yes. Is the Bible 